Good morning. So this is our week six. Today we will be transitioning to the geometry of linear algebra, something much more interesting and sophisticated in my view. So now that we are moving to a different uh, part of the book and uh, the course, let's look at our learning journey so far. So we started with the linearity and the basic operations, then moved on to two eliminations, Gaussian elimination and Gauss-Jordan elimination, basically to get to the solution of a system of linear equations. And now today is the start of the geometric view. So we will be moving on to vector spaces, bases and dimensions, etc. And that is actually the right way to look at uh, linear algebra is the right uh, intuition, which will help you come up with better algorithms and apply it in uh, different uh, fields in data science, machine learning, etc. And then we will move on to our advanced topics, all of which will be actually based on the geometric view to a large extent. Today we will start defining vector spaces, subspaces and dimensions. In fact, as we went through our uh, initial chapters, we kind of looked ahead. There were teasers and trailers of uh, things that were coming up and we actually saw these things. Whatever you see today will be almost like uh, a formalization or formal statements of things that you've already seen. Then we'll talk about spans of vectors, again something that we started seeing, I think from the very first, very first class, and the basis of spaces, bases I should say. Then we'll be looking at linear equations using the column picture. That will be something new, but you will see that that also is something that we did when we were talking about linear combinations right in the beginning. So most of the material will be from chapter 6 because today is week 6. But chapter 8, chapter 8 is more like a, a, a recap of whatever is going on. So there will be material from chapter 8 also in today's uh, class. So let's look at the uh, linear combinations once more. Even taking a step back, the basic operations on vectors this can be scaled, by which I mean that if you scale a vector, you get another vector. So take a vector in Rn and scale it by a scalar in R, a, rational, a real number. Now that scale version of the vector is a member of Rn. So if you scale a vector, you get another vector. If you have two vectors in Rn and you add them, you get a vector. So what that is saying is that Rn is actually closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition. Now that we have two operations, we can actually do the both at the same time. You can take a vector, scale it by some scalar. So take x1, scale it by s1, take x2, scale it by s2, and other. So if these two properties that linear combination, that thing is what we call a linear combination, scaling and adding, that also is a vector. So the set Rn is actually closed under linear combinations also. We can complicate life and we can take k vectors, not just two, and I can take k vectors of the kind xi, which are Rn, and take k, and then I can find a linear combination of the k vectors, and that also will be a member of Rn, which basically means that it's going to be a vector. So k vectors, take the linear combination, you get another vector. So that z there is what I mean by a linear combination of k vectors. And the fact that that is a member of Rn means that the set is closed under the operation of taking linear combinations because it's closed under the operation of, uh, under the basic operation of scalar multiplication and vector addition. So let's take an example. So I have two vectors. This is an example that we saw right in the beginning. Two vectors, red vector 1, 2, 1 in a horizontal direction and 2 in a vertical direction. And the blue vector 3, 1. And I can take a linear combination with the, the scalars just 1, which is just a sum. I get that vector, that uh, green vector. Or I can use some other scalars and I can start getting different uh, green vectors. So I can get a number of green vectors that I want by taking appropriate uh, scaling factors. So the point is any vector zi in R2 can be written as a linear combination of x1 and x2. The red vector and the vector are linearly independent. Can you see why? Can you tell me why they are linearly independent? Just by looking at the picture. They are not parallel. They are not on top of each other. They are not collinear. Collinearity and parallelness, we use them interchangeably in the context of vectors. So they are not collinear. They are not parallel. So it's a unique linear combination because the vectors are linearly independent. Now we can extend this to n dimension. We started with two dimension and that is something that we can visualize. Then we extend the game we play in a linear algebra. So two linearly independent vectors can span all of our two. Span of our two. I'm using the word span and I'm using the word linearly independent. 
without actually defining those things yet. But you know what it means so far. Any vector in R2 can be expressed as a linear combination of these two vectors that I started from. Linear independence of k vectors is defined now. I'm going to define it now. If no, none of those can be written as a linear combination of the rest, then they are linearly independent. I have k vectors and if I take any k minus one of them and try to express the kth one as a linear combination of these k minus one vectors, if I'm able to do it, then they're not linearly independent. If I'm not able to do it, then they're linearly independent. Spanning all of R2 would mean that any vector in R2 can be written as a unique linear combination, more formal definition of what we have. Now we are extending that to n dimension, saying that n linearly independent vectors are enough to span all of Rn, because two were enough to span all of R2. And more than that, they are necessary. One vector cannot span all of R2, one vector can span only one line. And two vectors, if they are linearly dependent, they are not enough either because they will still, still span only one line. But two linearly independent vectors can span the whole plane and that is enough. So you need two and uh, and you don't need more than two. Similarly, in Rn, you need n, but you don't really need more than n. n vectors are necessary and sufficient. Let me put them in uh, as columns of a matrix A. So each vector is in Rn, so I have n rows, n plus one columns. What's the maximum rank this uh, matrix can have? n rows and n plus one columns. What's the maximum rank? It is n. The maximum column rank this guy can have. That is again n. Column rank is the same as the row rank. What does that mean? That means what's another definition of uh, the column rank? The number of linearly independent columns. So that basically means there are only n linearly independent columns in this uh, slightly white matrix because the last one has to be a linear combination. So that sounds like a uh, just using words and not mathematical enough, but this is actually mathematical enough because if you actually run something like Gaussian elimination, but by using uh, column operations, the last column will turn out to be a zero column, which indicates that that is a linear combination of the, of the rest. So that is uh, proof enough. Okay, a linear combination of linearly independent vectors is unique. So if I have a linear combination Z of uh, K vectors, K scalars, if all the k vectors are linearly independent, then there is a unique linear combination. You don't get a different one. That is uh, fairly obvious, but this is actually a very important thing. There's only one set of uh, SI, the scalars, that will give you the, that linear combination. Couple of examples. This is one example where I have two vectors that are not linearly independent. I have x1 and they are not linearly independent. x1 is this guy here and x2 is the blue guy there. They are not linearly independent. You can see right away why, right? Because they're parallel to each other. In other words, x2 is just 2x1. It's a scalar multiple, which means it's on the same line defined by x1. And that line happens to be the, the green dotted line here. Now, if I take linear combinations of x1 and x2, they will all fall on that do green dotted line. There is no component outside that line that will take you outside of that line. So you're confined to that line. That is what linear dependence means in uh, two dimensions in R2. Now, if I have a, a zi, the green line, then I can find infinite ways in which I can actually write that linear combination. I can write, for instance, this z1, which is just a sum of x1 and x2. x1 is 1.5, 0.5, x2 is 3, 1. So x1 plus x2 is a 4.5, 1.5. So that I have here. And so that is one way of writing it. Or I can just take x1, multiply that by 3, and get the same number numbers or take x2 multiply by half of 3 I get the same thing because x2 is uh, twice x1 or I can write a CA1 3x1 plus 2 times some number x1 minus that number times x2 because 2 times t times x1 is the same as uh, t x2 so I'm subtracting uh, the same vector so I get an infinite combination because t can be any value all right so I find an infinite ways in which I can write any given z it is unique only if all vectors are linearly independent. Now, if you think about it, right at the beginning of today's class, we saw situations in which you have infinity of solutions. It's actually similar. The reason why we can write the green vector in an infinity of different ways is basically because some of linear equations has an infinity of solutions. It also means, suppose I take another green vector, I'm going to draw it in red, two, that is my vector, that guy, cannot be written as a linear x1 and x2 because it's not on that line, it's outside. Whatever you do to x1 and x2 cannot get outside that line. So that is like having no solution. That will have underlying somewhere 
a system of linear equations with no solution. That is actually the column picture of uh, linear equations that we will get to by the end of today's class. So we had two linearly dependent vectors in R2. One is a multiple of another one. So x2 was 2 times x1. And one vector by it's not enough to span uh, all of R2. It spans only one part, which is a line going through the origin. It always goes through the origin, which is important in R2. And if you have two vectors that are linearly dependent, in effect, you have only one because the second one is a linear is a linear combination. This is a scalar multiple of the first one in R2. And that also is the same line. So that is the same line that goes through the origin. And that you have to span all of R2. So one vector in any dimension Rn spans only one line going through the origin. If you have two vectors in, let's say, R3, so that's my R3. Suppose I have two vectors. My first vector is uh, this way. My red, my blue vector is this guy. And if I take all linear combinations of these two, what are the types of vectors that I might get if I take linear combinations of these two? Yeah, I can get any vector that is actually in uh, the xy plane. So if I have the first vector is uh, basically 1, 1, 0, 0, because that is along uh, x direction. And let's say the, the length is actually 1. And the second blue vector is actually 0, 1, 0. And taking linear combinations of this, x times that and y times this, I can get any x, y, 0. So any point in the x, y can be the tip of that vector, which is a linear combination of those two vectors. But I cannot get out of that plane. So I'm confined to one plane. So this is the situation that I just showed you, something very similar to that. So I have a vector x1, which is 1, 2, and 0. It's in R3. And x2, which is 3, 1, and 0. So the third direction is 0. And all kinds of linear combination I can I will never get anything other than zero in the third component. So you're confined to the xy plane, just like you in the whiteboard. All the combinations uh, of the type zi, they are all confined to the xy plane because the third component of x1 and third component of x2 are both zeros. And there's no way by taking linear combinations of those two, you can get outside that plane because the third component is always going to be zero. Now, suppose I add some number to x with the third component and some other number the third direction in for x2 random numbers i didn't really think about the numbers what am i going to get i have two vectors still they're not along the x direction or y direction so they are in some direction but they they define a plane then you have two vectors you have a plane you are defining a plane and all the linear combinations you have of these two vectors will be confined to that plane that is what i'm trying to show here as this uh, gray rectangle here which is tilted x1 and x2 they are on this plane and all linear combinations are going to be on that plane there's no component that will take you outside that plane it's hard to visualize but that's really true all linear components of zi are confined to the plane defined one and x2 you said uh, n plus one vectors in rn that means we have at least one linearly dependent vector but do you really have n plus one vector to say this or single vector in yes i mean you don't need to have n plus one vectors to have a linearly dependent vector you take the first vector say 1 0 0 and the second ve vector 2 0 0 in r3 the second one is linearly dependent on the other one just the first one times 2 you don't really need 3 plus 1 4 vectors but if you have 3 plus 1 4 vectors you can sure that at least one of them well one of them is actually a linear combination of combination of the rest we did four examples now of linear combinations looking at the geometry of uh, what it means in terms of planes and lines let's take three more examples suppose i have three vectors now not just two x1 x2 x3 x3 these two components some numbers yeah they're all prime numbers i like to use prime numbers so that it's not obvious that you can get a linear combination right away but i'm saying that the third one here has to be a linear combination of other two can you see why again using a matrix yeah if you put these two ve three vectors in a in a matrix the last row is zero so the rank is actually two. it's a three by three matrix so the rank two third column has to be linearly dependent now but by looking at the the vectors you can see that the third component is zero so whatever you do in terms of taking linear co combinations three you cannot get out of the the xy plane again the third component is always going to be zero because you can multiply this by t1 t2 and t3 but the third component is always going to be zero now let me take another set of vectors x1 x2 x3 now i have some numbers here but i 
chose x3 in such a way that there is already a linear combination of x1 and x2. So I know that if I put these three vectors in a matrix, I would get a rank 2 matrix because I know that the third one is actually a linear combination because I constructed it that way. Now again, since the third one is a linear combination, that is going to be in a plane that is by the first vector, the red vector and the blue vector and the origin. So that's the triangle and that defines a plane. Three points define a plane and the purple vector is going to be in that plane because it's a linear combination. All other vectors that you can create out of these three vectors will be on that plane. Now finally, let's take a good example. I start with the simple x1 and x2 where the third components were zero, but I add a third vector where the first two components are zero, but the one is one. Now I have enough vectors nearly independent because there's no way in which you can get x3 as a linear combination of the first two because whatever you do as a linear combination, the third component is going to be zero, but I need a one. So x3 is really linearly dependent of x1 and x2. And now I can get any vector in R3 using these three vectors because I can get the x and y components using x1 and x2, and I can get the z component, the third component using x3. So what I'm trying to convey to you is that three vectors linearly independent vectors are enough to span all of R3 and they are actually necessary also. Two would not be enough and three linearly dependent vectors as you saw here and here would not be enough. You need three linearly dependent vectors to span all of R3. So let's summarize all the seven examples that we went through. First, we saw two linearly independent vectors enough to span R2, our red vector and blue vector not on top of each other and you could get any other vector as a unique linear combination of these two. I'm using these uh, green phrases and uh, words kind of loosely without actually defining them. Okay, I'm going to define them starting next slide. So I have two linearly independent vectors in R2 and that's enough to span R2 and it's actually the vector space of R2 that I'm spanning and uh, the span of two linearly dependent vectors that is my x1 and x2 on top of each other in my second slide it's a vector subspace, it's a subspace and that was a line going through the origin. Why is that important? Why is it that origin will be a part of all vector subspaces? Two vectors, even if they are linearly independent, are in enough to span all of R3. They only span a subspace. This time it's a plane through the origin. In example 3, it was actually the xy plane. Two general vectors in R3 are still not enough. They, they span some other plane, hard to visualize, but this is again a plane through the origin. In the fifth example, we had three linearly dependent vectors. Again, not enough to span all of R3. It was only a subspace a plane going through the origin, which was a sub subspace. In uh, example five, there was an XY plane. In example six, we had three other linearly, linearly dependent vectors. Again, it was a plane going through the origin that was a subspace. And this was defined by the origin 1, 2, 2, which was the first vector, 3, 1, minus 1.5. That was a second vector. Finally, in the seventh example, we got three linearly independent vectors, good enough to span all of R3, and what it is spanning is a vector space called R3. So that is a summary of whatever we saw. So let me look at the definition of uh, a linear combination Z, a linear combination of uh, K vectors of kind Xi with K scalars of the kind Si. Basically trying to unearth in our favorite equation from this definition. So what I'm planning to do is just, just take this uh, formula here and uh, rename the variables instead of uh, Z. I have a B, I'm using the color coding and instead of K, I'm calling that N. Instead of Xi, I'm calling that AI. Instead of N, I'm calling M, etc, etc. So my equation now is uh, instead of Z, I have B as a linear combination of vectors of the kind AI, N of instead of xi or k of them and each vector is uh, a member of rm so this is always possible and this, all these uh, symbols are just placeholders i could use any symbol so i'm just using different i use these symbols so that i can then say that suppose i take these n vectors ai and place them as columns of a matrix a then each vector is a member of rm so this matrix is going to have m rows and n columns, n vectors standing side by side each of which is a uh, of uh, m elements so that matrix is uh, in r m by n now x and i can put those scaling factors in a column vector and call that vector x and there are n of them n of them so that vector will be a member n now b is a linear combination of uh, vectors each of which is of 
size r m so b is going to be a member of 2 so what this summation here is saying the combination is saying is actually my column picture of matrix multiplication saying b is a linear combination of the columns of weighted by the factors appearing in the vector x so this is an equation as you remember an equation is a statement of truth and the truth here is the fact that i want my b to be a linear combination of the columns of the matrix a weighted with my variables appearing in the vector x so for this equation to be true the variable vector x looking for should be that linear combination which will give me the right b i have my columns of a that are all numbers i have my b the, that is a bunch of numbers also and i want that particular linear combination specified in x1 x2 x3 such that this statement of truth turns out to be true so that is the equation so that is uh, actually the column picture of this uh, this uh, matrix equation i'm thinking of uh, linear combinations of columns of the matrix a than the rows of a being equations what it's saying is that i want the numbers in x the solution in x such a way that ax is equal to b the linear combination is actually equal to b but i may not be able to find those numbers it may not exist or i may be able to find too many of those numbers all those possibilities are there it doesn't guarantee anything it's just saying that the statement of truth is just that i am looking for those numbers that will satisfy this i may not be able to find it the statement of truth may not be satisfied all right actually since you asked the question under what condition will the statement of truth is guaranteed to be satisfied if i know that b is actually a linear combination of the columns of a even though i may not know what those those uh, scaling factors are if i know that is a linear combination then i know that i will always be able to find a vector x that will satisfy this that will be a condition for solvability okay so just keep keep this in mind but that is coming up in a couple we talk about span of vectors that is simply the set of all possible linear combinations of a set of vectors so i have a set of vectors and i take all possible linear co combinations that is another set all possible linear combinations an infinite set actually and that is a span of the the set of vectors so in other words given k vectors I take any scale, k scalars the span of that set of vectors the curly brackets here indicates set k vectors here there is another set of linear combinations of those k it's all linear combinations any si which is why if i take si to be all zero a zero the z equal to the zero vector that has to be there in the span okay so this is the the formal definition of the span remember span is for a set of vectors so set has a number of elements in it and that number in the fancy set theory language is called the cardinality the number of members in a set is called the cardinality of the set so that is uh, k in this because i have k vectors so that is the number of uh, vectors defining the span in our first example we had two vectors the red one and the blue one not collinear not linearly dependent and this their span is actually all of r2 because any vector in r2 could be expressed as a linear combination so it was all of r2 in example two i again had this the two red and blue but they were collinear and their span was a line in r2 and the line to go through zero because of what i just told you the scale vectors can be zero and zero has to be there in part of any span okay that was a line so that was a that what we will soon call a vector subspace actually something that is vector space now let's go ahead and define linear independence this is a bit tricky but stay with me i have k vectors in rn and i will call them linearly independent if we cannot find k scalars such that the linear combination is zero for non-zero si so if i cannot find k scalars s sub i not all zero such that the linear combination is zero then i will call these vectors uh, linearly independent so again looking at the example in the second example i had x2 the remember on top of each other x2 was twice x1 which means 2 x1 minus x2 is zero so some linear combination of x1 and x2 is equal to zero without the scalars being all zero at the same time okay so these two vectors were not linearly independent in example six i had the purple vector which was a linear combination of the other two vectors which means 3x1 plus 2x2 minus x3 was zero again a linear combination with the scalars not being all zero 
giving me the zero vector that means those vectors are not linearly independent so even linear dependence or independence also can have this equation hiding within so let me make that also explicit the original definition is k vectors xi are linearly dependent for some si not all zero i find this linear combination so now i'm defining linear dependence rather than independence so if i can find this uh, linear combination si not all zero i can find a linear combination to be zero then i will say that the vectors are linearly dependent i have this is in in rn so x at the first vector which is one zero 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 up to n and the second one two zero zero up to clearly these two guys are not linearly independent they are linearly dependent so uh, in order to get zero how can you do that i can just multiply this by, by minus two and do and that, that will give me zero so what am i trying to find here i'm trying to find two vectors such that uh, i need to get zero so i get uh, i take another vector here let me take a red vector which is zero one zero zero n of them suppose i take all three of them how can i find a linear combination that has all zeros i can have a linear combination of these two guys to give me zero without having a, a zero scalar but the last guy will always have to have zero multipliers mathematical statements when translated to words with double negatives will always confuse me because i'm slightly dyslexic about that kind of stuff again we play the same game of uh, renaming the symbols i am going to look at n vectors of the kind a i rather than x i and instead of s i i'm going to use x i the same game that we play and these guys are linearly dependent if you cannot find a combination of uh, x i's not all zero giving me zero so i can again put these a i's as columns of a matrix as we did before and x's uh, in a column the scaling factors and i'm looking for a b vector to be zero vector now it's equal to zero looking for that combination that will give me zero without x being to the zero vector in other words if i take x to be a zero vector obviously i will get zero on the right hand side doesn't that doesn't count so this guy doesn't count and also similarly if i have a matrix as a zero matrix i'll always have this is equal to zero that also doesn't count i'm looking for that combination of the columns of a which is not all zero which will give me zero if that happens then the columns of a are not really independent they are linearly dependent that statement and again this is an equation a statement of truth which says i want some linear combination of my columns of a to be zero without my scaling factors all zero don't want a zero vector multiply my columns but some other non-zero vector and if i can find such a vector in other words this equation has a solution a non-zero solution then my columns are not linearly independent that's what i'm saying and now if you look at uh, this equation ax equal to zero is called the homogeneous equation because in the equation form what you have are m equations all of them saying equal to zero m equations each term in the equations is order one so i have some equations i have on the other side is actually zero so if i look at any one of those equations each term there is of order order one in the unknown okay such an equation where all the terms have the order they are called homogeneous equation and here every single term has uh, the same order one and whatever is not the same order is actually zero this homogeneous equation on the other hand if i had a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus something something is equal to some number b not equal to zero that is not homogeneous because this one has the variable x to the power zero okay so that is not homogeneous you want all the the powers to be the same so an equation like x square plus y plus uh, y square equal to zero also is homogeneous but in homogeneous in uh, order two but that had to the concept of linear dependence vector space so define vector space as set of all possible vectors of a given number of uh, number of elements even number of components okay but knowing that they are vectors we already know that the set will be will have to be closed under the basic operations of the the vector scalar multiplication and addition and of course linear combinations also and the vector space should support all the operators that are specified okay so let me give you some examples rn if you think of rn let's take uh, r2 a normal xy plane that you might have seen every point here has a coordinate 
the pair of coordinates. And if you think of the coordinates as, as a vector, it satisfies all the conditions. And this coordinate space is actually a vector space too. It's, a, it's full of points. It's full of uh, coordinates that are like vectors. But there is a distinction between the coordinate space and the vector space because vector space, remember, is actually just a set of all possible uh, vectors. While the coordinate space is a space in which you have points and shapes and uh, curves and uh, there is a slight subtle distinction. Now, a similar set, if I take matrices of the same size, M by N, you can add them, you get another matrix of the same size. You can scale one, you get another matrix of the same size. So it satisfies all the, the properties. So that set also is a vector space because it's a set, it's a closed set and the operations are defined. Similarly, complex numbers are a vector space or very similar to R2. And if you have real functions, if you have uh, functions of the kind f1 of x, let's say a single variable, and this is defined between uh, 0 and 1, so I have some shape f1 and some other function 2, some other shape, all defined within that. And then if I add f1 plus f2, f1 plus f2, that is going to be a function also, call it g. If I scale f1, I get another one, call it h. They're all functions. So it has the operations and it satisfies the conditions too. And that is also the space of functions also is a vector space because it has the basic operations and it satisfies all the conditions. And it's just that if you look at the number of uh, points you have between 0 and 1, you have an infinity of them, an infinite dimensional space. So it's something like, I shouldn't call it R, but let me call R anyway, so something like R infinity. Okay, so it's a space of functions. This kind of uh, thinking of functions, uh, the space of functions as a vector space is the basis of Fourier transform. There we will be defining a bunch of uh, uh, vectors uh, that are functions as uh, the foundational basis vectors. And then everything else can be expressed in terms of those. It is also the foundation of quantum mechanics. The linear algebra that is used in quantum mechanics also use the same idea, functions as uh, vectors. Okay, you just have to define a dot product and then you can have orthogonal vectors etc so that is vector space of all possible vectors of a given number of components a vector subspace is defined in terms of a vector space it's a subset okay it's a subset of the vector space in which the operations scalar multiplication and vector addition are closed so if i were to give you an example we had example two we had a subspace which was a line if i take a vector here you know, on this line I scale it, what do I get? I get another vector on the same line. Suppose I have two vectors and I add them, I get uh, some other vector that is on the same line. I can never get out of the line. All the vectors are on the same line, so it is closed under scaling and, uh, and addition. So for that reason, this is a vector subspace, a line going through the origin. In example three, we had two vectors of the kind that spanned the xy plane, so that also is a subspace. Let's start talking about the basis basis of a vector space or a vector subspace. So again, definition, as we saw, if you have a bunch of vectors, you can create their span that will always turn out to be a subspace. And if you have enough of them, linearly independent ones of them, then you will have a vector space. Now, the number of uh, the, the set of vectors, the minimum vectors to span a space or a subspace is called its basis. So there are two requirements. They have to span the, the space or the subspace and they have to be linearly independent. So that's enough actually. If I say a bunch of vectors are linearly independent and they span the space, by space I mean R2, R3 and things like that. A subspace I mean by which I mean line or a plane inside uh, R2 or R3 or if they are linearly independent then they will be the minimum set. So let's uh, define it in a slightly different way. It's also the set of vectors which can form linear combinations to express any other vector in the space or a subspace okay as a finite linear linear combination so what it means is that you need enough number of vectors to span but not too many so let's take uh, maybe a couple of examples in our first we had two vectors x1 and x2 they were linear independent and we saw their span was actually all of r2 so those are uh, basis vectors for r2 you need both of them one of them was not enough and you don't need any more than two. If you had one more, you don't need it because these two already span all of R2. In fact, if you had one more, that would necessarily be a linear combination of these two. In the seventh example, we had X12 similar to the red and blue vectors here, except that I added a third component because they were in R3. 
and I added a purple vector which had a component only in the third direction. So these are also base vectors, one possible basis vectors for R3. Again, you need all three of them, any two of them will give you only a plane and you don't need any more because if you add one more, that will necessarily be a com combination of these three because these three already span all vectors in R3. So counter example, in uh, the second example, I had a subspace, which was a line. I had two vectors in it, x1 and x2, such that x2 was twice x1. And you don't need both of them. You need only one of them to span all of that line. That's one vector will define a line. And then you just have to specify length of that vector to give the position in that line. Okay, so if you had two, that is one too many. So for that subspace, which is a line, you need only one. And in the third example, we had two vectors in R3. That is not enough. One more vector because these two would span only part of R3, which was the XY plane. Easy to see it when you see examples, but kind of hard to visualize or understand it maybe when I see in, uh, these things in words. Okay. For the first basis sample, the third vector is not independent of the first basis example. This one. First example, I have only two vectors, Patricia. What are the third vector you're talking about? You're talking about this one, the seventh example or first counter example. Well, this was a good basis because they were linearly independent if in R2. And this also was a good example. Seventh one also was a good example. They are linearly independent in R3. The counter example, the first one, which was the second example in our, in our uh, slides, these two vectors are not linearly independent. Okay. And you don't need both of them. You need only one of them. They are not distinct vectors really. Okay. So this one, uh, too many. That's why this is not a basis. But remember, these two vectors will sp still span. If you take these two vectors and find their span, they will sp still span the line. That's not enough. They have to be linearly independent and minimum set. They, that is actually implied. One is the other. If you take the linearly independent vectors, then that will be the minimum set. Okay. So this is too many and here not enough. Okay. All right. Dimension is actually the number of uh, base vectors needed to span the space or the subspace. So as you know, we defined the span as a span of a set of vectors and the set had cardinality, which is just some vectors in the, in the set. So I can use fancier language here to say that uh, the dimension of a vector space is the cardinality of any basis set. Now you can have several different basis sets because you can have uh, different vectors. When I take two vectors, scale it or whatever, you will get different basis vectors, basis sets really. But the number of basis vectors will be the same as uh, the dimension and that property is immutable. Okay, For a given space or a subspace, there is only one dimension. By one dimension, I mean it's got only one number that is the, that represents the dimension of that uh, space or subspace. Okay, For a vector space, the dimension happens to be the same as the number of components. So if I have R3, each vector will have three components. So it's the dimension of R3 is actually three. But for a subspace in R3, that is not true, which is something you have to see later. Okay. Uh, an example, Rn has a dimension of n, and that is the number of linearly independent vectors needed to span it. Okay. And x, a member of Rn, will mean that x has n elements. So that's just the illustration. Okay. And if you have for vector subspaces, a line through zero vector has a dimension of one. Okay. In Rn, so it's a vector for it, but it lives in Rn. So each vector in that subspace will have n components, but the dimension of that line is only one. A plane has a dimension of two similarly. Okay. Space of functions, on the other hand, will have infinite dimensions. Now let's take one special set of uh, basis vectors. That would be the, what they call identity matrix, the identity basis or the coordinate basis. Okay. It will form uh, a basis and it's actually a very good vector basis set that you can that you can find the columns of the identity matrices and they specify the direction space. So this we actually did this actually a slide a couple of weeks ago. In uh, R3, I have one vector, second vector, third vector, call them by some name that physicists are fond of. And then I can express any vector X, Y, Z as a linear combination of those three vectors. Okay. And this happens very good basis because each of them, the length is one or orthogonal to each other. I use the word perpendicular, but later on we will get more sophisticated and we'll use the word only. Okay. So orthogonal basically means the dot product any pair is zero unless it is in which case it's going to be one. So i times i dot j one times and so on. 
Okay, let's move on to the concept of orthogonality. Orthogonal basically means perpendicular in terms of uh, things that you can visualize. If you think of vectors as lines with uh, arrows at the at the head, then orthogonal just means uh, perpendicular. Okay, but we also saw vectors where more like functions. There you cannot really talk of functions being perpendicular to each other, which is what orthogonality orthogonal is more general okay so the definition is if the dot product whichever way you find the dot product for functions you have to define it like an integral or something that dot product if that dot product is zero then the vectors are orthogonal to each other okay now i can extend that to to toward the orthogonality of subspaces if i have two subspaces every vector in one subspace is perpendicular to every vector in the other subspace then these two vectors are uh, these two subspaces are orthogonal to each other so that's orthogonality of subspaces so let me my whiteboard here so i have a subspace that would be my xy plane the whole thing here that is one sub subspace square or rectangle there it's the whole plane okay it's the whole thing vector in my red subspace my red subspace s1 my red subspace s1 and s2 are all perpendicular to these two which is actually the y-axis so the y-axis there are many vectors on the, the y's and they are both in s1 and s2 those vectors the blue vectors are not perpendicular to each other itself so these two are not orthogonal subspaces in fact the only vector that is perpendicular to itself which is that vector is a strange vector that is perpendicular or orthogonal to itself what is that vector what's the vector that is it's a zero vector so that's the only one that can be in the intersection of two subspaces if you want to call them orthogonal okay so in this case i could have taken my xy plane and then of that instead of my green so i have my x y x y plane as my subspace one and i could use just the the z axis subspace two all vectors along the z axis then every vector that is along the z axis is perpendicular to every vector that is on x y plane and their intersection is actually just a zero vector here so they are orthogonal to each other okay so that's what i wanted to say and if you just take uh, the x-axis and y-axis argument you can see that they are actually orthogonal too now subspaces of uh, x y and y z as we saw they are not orthogonal because there's a whole intersection of vectors along the y-axis they are not orthogonal to itself so unless the intersection is actually the vector s1 and s cannot s cannot be orthogonal to each other now, there is another co concept which is orthogonal complements complements which means all the vectors that are orthogonal to any vector in one space is in the complement nothing else that is orthogonal to it again that will make more sense if i give you an example so again let's go back and to my whiteboard i have my s1 and s2 okay all the vectors that are orthogonal to s1 are they in s2 can you find a single vector that is orthogonal to my red red space s1 that is not in my space s2 is there any vector that is orthogonal to some vector let's take some vector in the xy plane like this some vector I should probably draw it like this some vector like that some vector lying on the xy plane i want to find a vector that is orthogonal to that can it be anywhere other than on the z axis can you think of any other place where it can be it's a real question i want an answer it's just a yes or no answer so can you think of any other any vector that is not on the z axis that is orthogonal to the red vector that i just drew no all the vectors that are orthogonal to all the vectors in s1 have to be on the on in the space s2 so these two are actually orthogonal complements on the other hand if i take just the the y axis uh, something wrong with my pen today is this as my s1 okay and if i think of uh, some vectors that are orthogonal to s1 they don't have to be on the z axis they could be along uh, this axis for instance that would be perpendicular also so this vector also is perpendicular but that's not along uh, s2 that's not in s2 so these two are not s1 and two in this case are not orthogonal complements okay for orthogonal complements you can see that the dimension of uh, one and its orthogonal complement will have to be the total dimension of the space that uh, contain this contains these two okay for three i have the xy plane and uh, its complement will be the z axis x axis and y axis they are orthogonal to each other but not complements because their dimensions add up to two not three so those are just examples this might sound a little 
uh, weird. We don't seem to be using that yet, but uh, the orthogonality and orthogonal elements will come in uh, useful later when we start talking about the spaces uh, related to a matrix. Then there is this zero vector that I talked about. It's a vector that is uh, parallel and perpendicular to all other vectors at the same time. This I will leave you to read this in the textbook. I think I added this as a box either in chapter 8 or chapter 6. So take a look at that and just read it and appreciate it. We already went through this uh, weeks ago. Okay, it's got some interesting questions about the zero number also. It's a very special number. It's a spe very special vector. And uh, for an Indian, we are quite proud of the fact that it was an Indian who invented I shouldn't say invented, discovered this uh, zero number. So there was a number system long time ago where my people knew all about one, two, three, etc. But they did not know about zero. Nobody thought about it because it takes a peculiar mind to actually figure out there is something called nothing, zeroness. Okay, now there is an, another concept, the distinction between the coordinate space, that's the space in which we live, where we have points, and then there's the vector space that we just defined, which is just a set of numbers. A set of vectors. So the space is just a set of uh, vectors. There's no, there are no points. There are no planes or lines or anything in a vector space. You just have vectors. It's a set. It's like concept. It is closed under multiplication and vector addition, and that's it. But in a normal space, you have points, and you can have shapes like uh, surfaces or uh, lines or planes and stuff like that, which are all subsets of points, really. Okay, those are coordinate spaces. Those are the spaces that we know of, and we use the same symbols R, R2, R3, etc. for coordinate space as well as for vector space because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two. But they are really different entities. You should be careful in mixing or at least you should know that you're mixing them because if you don't, at some point, it's going to come back and bite you. It's going to come back and hurt you. Okay, so you have to be careful. So vector space is just a set of vectors or vector-like objects like functions or whatever. It's an abstract space, an abstract concept no lines, no planes, etc. They use the same symbols. Okay. All right. So you might think that it's a distinction without a difference, as they say. And uh, it may be true, but you have to effort. You have to be careful about uh, this. This also, I wrote it up as a, as a box in the textbook called Notational Abuse, I think. And uh, take a look at that also. It might be interesting. All right. Now let's move on to the geometry of uh, linear equations. Okay. So in the code phase where you have lines, and curves and planes etc there is a picture that we already saw that was the algebra of uh, linear algebra that we looked at where we said equations make lines or planes so it, an equ a linear equation in two dimension in r2 is a line and a linear equation in r3 we, what is a li linear equation in r3 what's that? i didn't get that could okay. you try again i'm gonna try it okay what's the linear equation in r3 what's its shape in r3 it's a plane. Okay, so we talked about that, and we talked about intersections of two lines, or two planes, or three planes, uh, when we tried to visualize uh, the solutions. That is one geometry. It is geometry, but that's not the geometry of linear algebra. Okay, so what we did there was of each row equation, and then looked at the the geometry of that equation in the coordinate space. Okay, the shape of that equation in the coordinate space. That is really the row picture of equations because we are going row by row, equation by equation. Okay, so if you had common points, then you might have infinity of solutions or single point of intersection, unique solution, parallel lines, inconsistent equations, etc. We saw all that. But there is another one called the column picture of vector space, a column picture of uh, equations that would live in uh, vector spaces. What A is that B, as we saw, is a linear combination of the columns of A and the the columns of a are vectors in some vector space and we are trying to find the la right linear combination so that's what we're trying to do okay so the solution would be the coefficients of that right linear combination which will specify the x i's and that would be the solution so let's look at that so this visualization is in terms of the columns of a so it's called the column picture of uh, equations and this is the right picture in linear algebra. This is a more sophisticated picture because it will lead to a deeper understanding of, uh, of uh, the structure of solutions, etc. And also it will help you develop better algorithms if you can kind of derive intuitions from this kind of uh, thinking. Okay, so let's set uh, the row picture. I had two equations, x plus y equal to 5, x minus y to 1. And there's an section there, a unique solution. 
this is not the, the geometry that we are thinking about this is the geometry i have x plus y equal to 5 x minus y equal to 1 so i have a vector standing here a red vector and a blue vector and i'm taking a linear combination because the matrix multiplication okay i mean a linear combination of a1 and a2 giving me e. so i have one vector there the second vector there and my constants vector standing here and i want to find the right linear combination of a1 and a2 such that i can get b if you remember we did this we when we tried to construct the uniqueness of linear combinations we actually did this so what we would do is to draw a blue line through the tip of uh, the green vector parallel to my blue vector and then extend my red vector to hit the the blue dotted line and that scaling will give me the foot scaling factor okay it turns out that that scaling factor is actually three similarly through the tip b i will align parallel to my red vector a red dotted line and i'll extend my blue vector to hit this uh, this uh, red line and that will give me a second scaling factor that turns out to be two okay and if i add these uh, dashed bright colored vectors then i do get uh, my uh, green vector so that means it's actually a linear combination of uh, a1 and a2 personified in a1 prime and a2 prime and the scaling factors the scaling factors needed x is the length of a1 prime by the length of a1 the norms similarly for a2 also and then i can see that b is actually x a1 plus y a2 and x and y are the solutions is the right linear combination so that is the the column picture okay and I have a plus or minus here because if I'm scaling in the same direction, it's plus. But if I had to scale it in the opposite direction, it just becomes negative. Let's look at what does the right LC imply? Does it mean that X vector that gives? No, it just means that I'm trying to find the right linear combination of A1 and A2 to get the B vector. And that right combination, if you put it in the form of a, a vector, X uh, x and y in standing in a column that is a solution vector that means it's nothing deeper than that there is no deeper implication as of yet okay it's just a different way of looking at the same set of equations in six form okay now if i have inconsistent equations if i draw picture a parallel line they never meet that is one way of looking at it and if i look at it in the in the column picture again i have two columns now you can see that they are the same two columns I mean it says there i'm trying to find x and y such that i get 5 1 as my b so what do i have i have two vectors a1 and a2 i've shown them slightly separated just so that you see them but they are actually right on top of each other a1 is equal to a2 i'm trying to find a linear combination so let's follow our construction i'm going to draw a line blue dotted line through the tip of uh, uh, my green vector and try to extend my vector to hit the line it'll never hit the line because it is actually parallel to the other vector too so there's no solution there similarly if i try to draw the the red dotted line through the tip and try to make the other one it'll never find so i cannot find a solution because the construction doesn't work okay so that is just another way of looking at it it might look a bit unnatural or uh, cumbersome at this point but it turns out that this is the right geometry that we need to have in uh, in linear algebra okay why that is the case will become clearer in two more slides so if i have three equations with a solution this is the the coordinate space row picture but the column picture becomes something in three dimensions and we're not going to worry about that but what i'm really going to worry about is this inconsistent equations so i have three equations again they don't have a common point of intersection so no solution so inconsistency there's no solution because if you do the gaussian elimination the third equation will read zero equal to one okay now it, at point when we saw this earlier i said that maybe somewhere inside you have the best possible solution somewhere inside that triangle maybe the centroid maybe somewhere it wasn't clear where it should be let's look at a picture of this one now again i don't want to work in three dimension complicated 3d so let me simplify the last equation by doing the gaussian elimination just so that it reads 0x plus 0y equal to 1 so that's my third equation okay so i have one vector 0 0 uh, sorry 1 1 0 second vector 1 minus 1 0 is the second vector here 
and I'm trying to find a linear equation of those two so that I get uh, my 5, 1, 1. Okay, so 5, 1, 1, which is my constant vector. So this is what I'm trying to do. So let's try our construction again. So I, might, I have my first vector, 10 vector. So I'm showing you the xy plane now. The z plane, z axis actually coming out of this plane towards me. Okay, so this uh, green vector is not actually on the xy plane. It's actually sticking out by one unit at the tip. So this guy is one unit it's outside outside that plane. So in order to show that, let me draw, draw its, uh, its shadow, shadow on the xy plane. It's like I'm shining light on it from this, from my bright eyes here and uh, so cast a shadow on the xy plane so that now you can kind of see that it's actually three-dimensional now my construction is to draw a line tip of uh, my vector parallel to my blue vector okay and try to extend my vector a1 the red vector to that line but it doesn't hit that line because this blue line blue dot line is not the xy plane it's slightly sticking so the red vector is going to go underneath it and it's going to it's never going to hit the the blue line but it's going to hit the the shadow of the blue line because the shadow on the xy plane will intersect the, the red line the red vector so there is some point where it might intersect not really intersect but there is some approximate place where it might intersect similarly if i take my red vector draw a line parallel to my red vector through the tip of uh, my green vector again the blue vector is not going to intersect it when i extend but it will intersect its shadow, the shadow of the red line, the shadow cast by the red line on the xy. And that, you might think of that as the best possible solution. So I'm projecting my green vector onto my xy plane, that is my uh, gray vector there. That is the best possible projection I can have. That is the closest, that other closest, the other position will be farther away from it. And then I can solve because it's already on the xy plane. And that solution be the best possible solution. So there's a natural way of uh, describing the, the best possible solution. Even there is no real solution, but the best or the closest you can get to a solution is actually kind of naturally emerging from our, from our column picture. Okay. So there's something to keep in mind. This is the idea of projection onto a different plane and then solving an equation based on the projection which is actually basically linear regression. This is exactly what we are going to do for linear regression. Okay, that is a machine learning technique, which is a powerful machine learning technique. So out of this uh, fairly simple picture, picture, once you start thinking about uh, the equations of, uh, as columns of uh, the coefficient rather than the rows. Okay, so that's the reason why we do the column. Picture, okay, so the row picture, the coordinate space, you have uh, as many dimensions in that coordinate space as you have uh, the variables. So if you have two variables, regardless of how many equations you have, you're working in R2, okay? It looks a little simpler because basically we're working with small number of uh, variables. But when you start working with say 50 or 100 variables, the row picture or the column picture really make any difference. Both, both those guys are impossible to rise. And it turns out that column is actually better in terms of algebra. So the column picture, the dimension that you're working with is the dimensionality of each column which is the number of equations is m rather than n number of equations so it might look a little hard at this point because we had only two variables and three equations so three was bigger than uh, two but it is actually the right geometry to look at okay. so there is a question how do you construct the projection line so that is here what i did was to imagine i have this uh, green vector that is sticking out of my the plane of my my uh, monitor here by one unit and if i were to shine light on it from z axis perpendicular to the 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 white plane then that cast a shadow and that i can say that uh, the shadow is going to be at five one zero so that is just imagining how i would do it by hand how you would do this mathematically is something that we will learn start learning next week and the week after that and that is the real agenda for a couple of weeks uh, coming up so that projection as an operator, as a as an as a operation and an operator as a matrix, etc. Start seeing uh, starting next week. Okay, right now think of this as uh, me shining light from my face into this uh, the 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 slide that you're seeing in front of you. The z-axis is coming to my nose, and that's where the light is coming from. And that's the shadow of the the green vector onto the plane of the slide, which is shown in uh, the gray vector. Okay, so that's what I'm doing now for now. Just uh, 
I didn't actually construct it mathematically. I'm just doing it uh, in words. So let's kind of uh, summarize what we did. Uh, before that, uh, questions you want to ask me about today or last week, in general, anytime, any questions? The answer is always 42. No questions. All right. So let's, uh, how come I'm seeing uh, red, so greens? Any questions, anybody? All right. Thank you. So we started with uh, the definitions of vector spaces, subspaces, and their dimensions. So vector spaces, collections of all possible ve vectors of given number of components, that would be a vector space in our context. And the more rigorous and, uh, and mathematically accurate definition is actually there in chapter eight. It is the same thing, except that you go into specifying everything that is needed for a vector space to be a vector space. Okay, so that's a vector space, R, R2, R3, R, R0 also, all those things are vector spaces. Spaces would be a subset of a vector space, which is closed under the basic operations that we defined. And then we talked about basis vectors. Basis would be, uh, okay, actually let's go in order. So we started with linear combinations. That is at the core of all the definitions. Taking linear combinations is basically about the, the basic operations that we we have defined, like scalar multiplication and addition. So do, we do them both at the same time. That would be a linear combination and vector space for our purposes i can just say that it's a set set that part is important of all possible vectors which is closed under the defined operations which are scalar multiplication and vector addition a subspace is a subset of a vector space closed under the same two operations now practically a vector subspace turn out to be a span of a set set of vectors that is a practical definition okay now basis is a minimum set of uh, vectors that span the set the space or the subspace minimal set of uh, vectors to span the subspace that is the basis the dimension is just the number of uh, vectors in in any basis set they're all the same an immutable property of a space or a or a subspace so number of vectors got this fancy name cardinality so since it's fa fancy I want to use it it's a cardinality of the basis set. okay now uh, we also looked at the spans of vectors and basis of uh, space the span is a set of all linear combinations of uh, given vectors. I have a set of vectors to begin with, and you take all possible linear combinations. That would be the span of that, that, that set. Second set is a span of the first set. And the number of vectors in the first set, set is a cardinality of, uh, of the span. And the basis is the minimal number of vectors needed to span the vector space or subspace, as we said right here. Then we looked at uh, linear equations in the column picture as terms of uh, as a columns of uh, the coefficient matrix A, as a, as a linear combination of the columns of uh, the coefficient matrix A. So our equation AX equal to B is basically saying that uh, something like that vector X, which has the components that the linear combination taken with those components of the of A will give me B. So that is a statement of truth, AX equal to B equation. So row picture, is looking at the matrix, the augmented matrix, row by row, each of each one of which is a an equation. Column picture is looking at uh, the coefficient matrix, column by column, and looking at the linear combination that is constants vector. And that view is at the row for most words to follow from now on.